All right, guys, so we're getting to the good stuff now. Um, we uh, have talked about a lot so far about the causes of the Revolutionary War, and we still have not even gotten to the actual Revolutionary War yet. So um, we're getting into the nitty gritty of it now, though. This is where the action is starting. So pay close attention. Um, today's lesson is covering chapters 11, 12, and 13. This will be your only lesson that you have to listen to this week. Um, and you will get um, some slides that you will have to complete today. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Or you don't have to complete them today. If you complete them on Friday, you get them started today. So what we're doing today is first I'll go over our objectives and our success criteria. Then we're going to talk about the colonies resisting. Then we're going to get into the fighting. The fighting actually begins. And then at the very end, we're going to talk about preparing for war. The colonists are preparing for war. So those are the big topics for today. Um, first, your objective today is that you can explain the events that led up to and caused the Revolutionary War. We've been doing a lot of that. There's a lot of the taxation without representation, the proclamation of 1763. All of these things were really stirring the pot and upsetting the colonists. Um, and things just continued to get worse. And that's what eventually led to the Revolutionary War. And it's important to know um, those events so that you really understand why the colonists really wanted to separate from England because remember that Great Britain was the most powerful empire in the world. So why would these colonies want to separate? Well, all of these events really tell you why. And we live in the United States, so it's important for us to really know how we became the United States. Um, when you're done, the, you're going to know you're successful when you can successfully fill out these notebook slides, the interactive notebook slides. Guess what? You've been doing these a lot. Um, you've seen them before. These ones are, it's called the Causes of the Revolutionary War notebook slides. These ones are just a teeny bit different though. You're going to actually be dragging the answers in order. You have to be putting um, these events in order of when they happened. All of these slides, slides one through four. Um, and then after that, you're going to tell me a little bit about the First Continental Congress. I have a little note here to tell you where to find that in your reader. You're going to be talking about <clears throat> the battles of Lexington and Concord and the Battle of Bunker Hill. Again, I gave you the page numbers that you can find the information um, in your reader. And I'll be talking about those today too. And then of course, you're going to be filling out about the Second Continental Congress. So it seems like it's a lot of work, but this is not due until Friday, friends. So after your lesson today, this is all you'll be working on for the rest of the week in history. So I do expect you to turn it in. Um, if you don't turn it in, it is a zero. So make sure that you are working hard and please ask me if you have any questions. I'm happy to help. Um, but getting back to our lesson here. Um, so that's how you're going to know you're successful, is if you can fill out those slides, if you um, can answer those questions, you know that you got the, you figured out the objective pretty well. So starting with chapter 11, the colonists resist. We're going to go back a little bit to last week when we ended on talking about the intolerable acts. This was um, brought up by King George after the Boston Tea Party. Remember, he was mad. Um, Parliament was successful in the Intolerable Acts. They made, their whole point of making the Intolerable Acts was to make the people of Massachusetts miserable. Remember, they wanted people to turn in the Sons of Liberty, the men that dumped the tea in the harbor. The, King George wanted those men, and he thought that if he could make um, Bostonians miserable, somebody would eventually turn them in. And they really did make life miserable for um, <clears throat> Bostonians. There were soldiers everywhere. They were living in col uh, colonist homes. They closed the harbor, the harbor so they couldn't get food or they couldn't leave through by ship. Um, but there was one thing they didn't expect. Parliament did not expect what would happen between the colonists, and that's the other colonies. The other colonists came 
to help Massachusetts. They came together to help Massachusetts. Um, Pennsylvania sent barrels of flour because Boston and Massachusetts couldn't get supplies because the Intolerable Acts basically shut down Massachusetts. Nobody could come in and nobody could leave, kind of like a siege. Um, so Pennsylvania was upset by this, so they sent their fellow colonists in Massachusetts flour. And South Carolina, they sent rice. Uh, Connecticut sent money. And Virginia, they sent wheat and corn. Um, and Virginia, their leaders went even further than just sending supplies. They actually set aside a day of fasting and prayer for Boston. The, what this is telling you guys is that the colonists and all of the other colonies were upset about the Intolerable Acts and what was happening to the people of Massachusetts. They didn't like that Great Britain could do this to them because if they can do that to the people of Massachusetts, could Great Britain come into their colony and do the same thing? Um, and Virginia's leaders declared the Intolerable Acts a threat to their liberty in every colony. Um, if, Like I said, if they could do this in Massachusetts, could they do it anywhere? They took a really bold step. They called for delegates or representatives for, from each colony to meet and to discuss what to do next. This would become, this is the second time that they met. Remember, they didn't really have self-government. They were ran by parliament. They, like, individual colonies had people to help make laws, but they never came together. This was only the second time that they came, they came together since the Stamp Act, Cong Stamp Act Congress met. And this was called the First Continental Congress, and it's extremely important in American history. Um, they came together in September of 1774, and there were 56 colonial leaders, they, and they all met in Philadelphia, which is in Pennsylvania. They represented 12 of the 13 colonies, and it was only Georgia that did not come to this Congress. Um, and they thought the meeting was very important. They know, uh, they know, but you, and we know that by the men that they chose to represent their colonies. They knew it was important because of who they sent. Um, Virginia sent George Washington, Patrick Henry, and Thomas Jefferson. Those are huge, famous names in American history. In fact, you've heard three of them before. Massachusetts sent Sam Adams and John Adams. And New York sent John Jay. These are all extremely important people. And they all went to this First Continental Congress. And it was actually John Adams that said, there, there is in the Congress a collection of the greatest men upon this continent. And he wasn't wrong. These were extraordinary men. And without these men, the United States probably wouldn't be the United States. At this meeting, um, what it was about... They, they shared their anger for, for the British. They were angry at the British, and they all shared those same feelings. And they decided to come up with what was called a Declaration of Rights. And this is not to be confused with the Declaration of Independence. That has not happened yet. But what they did is they demanded the same rights of an Englishman. Remember, they are English citizens. They're part of the British Empire, and they believe they should have every right that the British somebody in Britain would have, and they were t those rights were being taken away, and so they demanded those same rights. Um, and they even listed ways that their rights were being taken away, things like the Intolerable Act, the Quartering Act, um, the Tea Act, really. All of these were being taken away from them, and they made sure to list this down on paper, and they sent it to King George. And they made two big decisions. First, they voted. Um, the delegates all voted to stop trade with Britain until the Intolerable Acts were repealed. So even though this was only happening in Massachusetts, all of the delegates decided that all 13 colonies would stop trade with Britain until those were repealed. And what that means, meant was they were going to continue to boycott anything made from Britain. They would buy nothing from Britain, and they would absolutely not sell anything to Britain either. And for the southern colonies, that's a big deal because a lot of the things that they grow, those cash crops, were sent to Great Britain. They also decided that they were going to meet again. This was not going to be the last time that they met. They were going to meet again to see if there was any progress in after this, um, these decisions were made. And that was, they were going to meet in May of 1775. 
<clears throat> but the biggest result of the Congress was a new identity for these colonists. The colonies no longer felt like they were separate from each other. Before all of this happened, Virginia kind of felt like they were their own country, and New York kind of felt like they were their own country. But after the First Continental Congress, when they recognized that they all could work together to separate from Britain or to be angry at Britain, they now felt like they were they felt like they were part of one country. They could all work together to be part of one country. And Patrick Henry, you know him, the give me liberty or give me death uh, speech that he gave. He was a great speaker and he said this quote. He said, the differences between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, Vanians, New Yorkers, and New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian, but I am an American. And that speaks volumes because before then they were all part of Great Britain, but they kind of felt like they were their own little countries. Now they were all one. So they were unified. Um, but now we're, let's talk about the fighting. Because we know that it wasn't just the First Continental Congress and now we're the United States. There was a war that happened. So the fighting is going to start now. So after the First Continental Congress, um, by 1775, colonists were kind of expecting fighting to be happening. Um, they knew it was going to happen because they saw what was happening in Massachusetts. Um, so they decided to continue to strengthen their militias. Remember, the militias are the small groups of men that were um, making a sm like small little army. So they were continuing to strengthen their militias to prepare them to fight. Um, and each militia was made up of citizens that volunteered to be part-time soldiers. So these were farmers. These were merchants. They were people that just volunteered their time. They were not part of a military. They were not part of the army or the marines. They were just people that worked farms, that had everyday jobs, and they decided to be part of a militia. And in March of 1775, the Virginia General Assembly debated on whether or not their colony should, should, should prepare for war. Um, they knew that they wanted um, the rights of an Englishman. They had met with the um, Continental Congress, but they weren't really sure if they should be strengthening their army, their militias or not. Um, mostly because there were some that really did oppose and felt that England could possibly still change their mind. Um, they were still, they still liked the king. Um, they still felt like maybe England would, would, have a change of heart and they would start taking care of their citizens again. But Patrick Henry came up again. I love this man. Um, he believed it to be the time of action. It was not, we, they had sent petitions, they boycotted, this has been happening for too long and it was time for these colonists to take action. And this is where he gave his give me liberty or give me death speech. And he said that war had already started but he wasn't really correct. He was saying the war meaning that they were being treated unfairly. But just three weeks after he spoke to everybody in the Virginia General Assembly, it was only three weeks later that the fighting really did begin. Um, real quick, this is a vocabulary word, Minutemen. You should know that one because we are the Minutemen, right? Well, Minutemen... Um, well, the militias in Massachusetts had been training to fight, right? And these were farmers and townspeople, and they called themselves Minutemen. So the militias were made up of Minutemen, and they called themselves that because they could be ready to fight the British in a minute's notice. They were ready to, pr they were, they could be in their fields farming, and when they found out that the British were on their way, they could be ready to fight whenever they needed to. And the Minutemen had been collecting guns and gunpowder and all sorts of supplies. Um, they had, and they had been keeping all of their supplies in a village called Concord. Um, they were kind of storing it all together. Remember, they didn't have the big army that England had. So just, you know, guns and gunpowders. Whenever they were able to acquire those supplies, they stored them in this town called Concord. Um... Let's backtrack a little bit. The British. Remember um, when the Intolerable Acts were um, put in place, the uh, governor of Massachusetts had been removed of his 
position and they put in a British general to govern Massachusetts. And um, his, uh, his name was Thomas Gage, General Thomas Gage. And he had learned about the supplies that was being stocked and hidden in Concord. He'd learned about that. Um, he discovered the, these secrets. And he also learned that three of the Sons of Liberty, who they were trying to arrest because they were part of the Boston Tea Party, John Adams, Sad Adams, and John Hancock were, Hancock were in Lexington. And Lexington was pretty close to Concord. So he heard about these three men that were there, and he also had found out about the supplies in Concord. So he knew that Lexington was on the way to Concord, so Gage's plan, General Gage decided to send soldiers to Lexington first to get Adam, the two Adams and Hancock. They wanted to arrest him. And then once they acquired those three men, they were going to uh, march their soldiers over to Concord and take the hidden supplies from the militia take everything that they had stored. They didn't want them to have weapons. They knew that fighting was coming too. Um, and his plan was that they were going to do this all in the dead of night. That way that no one, that the colonists, would notice. They would be able to take Lexington by surprise. But the Sons of Liberty found out. And they, so they found out about his plan. And this is pretty cool. And I'm going to put a video about this later this week. You're going to have to watch it. You guys have all heard of Paul Revere, I'm sure. Well, two of the Sons of Liberty that found out were Paul Revere and William Dawes. And they decided that once they found out the secret, they needed to warn the people of Lexington and Concord. But there was no Facebook statuses, there was no text messaging or phone calls, and they couldn't mail a letter because this was happening right away. So... Paul Revere and William Dawes decided to ride, get on their horses and ride ahead of the soldiers to warn the, those citizens on their way. I'll put a video in and it will tell you more about this later. So Paul Revere had rode ahead and they, uh, the people at Lexington were pretty prepared. So the British troops arrived in Lexington at dawn and they expected to see no one. Um, but instead... They saw 70 Minutemen facing, facing them on the grass, uh, grassy area in the village because they had been warned by Paul Revere. The Minutemen leader, Captain John Parker, told his men not to fire unless they were fired at by the British. And if you look at this picture, you can see how close they are. That's how close they had to be before they would shoot because the, pro the thing is, is the Minutemen did not have a lot of ammo. And they didn't have anything to waste. So if they, if they were too far away, their ammunitions would not be able to, they'd run out before they could um, accurately hit the British soldiers. Now, the British, the British stood about 600 to 7 men against a small group of colonists. Remember, you've got 600 to 700 British soldiers against about 70 Minutemen. That's a big advantage here. And the British had ordered the colonists to leave. So before the fighting even started, they ordered those colonists to leave. And, um, but they wouldn't leave. And suddenly there was a shot, and they all began shoot firing at one another. And within minutes, eight of the Minutemen were dead and ten were wounded. <clears throat> the British caught both William Dawes and Paul Revere before they could get to Concord. So... Even though the militia was ready, they did, they did get caught. Um, however, there was another man named Samuel Prescott who was with Paul Revere and William Dawes, and he continued to ride ahead of the British um, to warn of the British attack. And when the British got to Concord, they expected to find all of the hidden weapons that the militia had been hiding. But because of Samuel Prescott, um, the militias were able to move all of those supplies. Um, and into a, a different hiding place. So the British soldiers weren't able to get those supplies. The British then, because they were angry, decided to destroy anything that they, they could find. Bridges, homes, anything they could, they decided to destroy them. Um, but they also found Minutemen that were waiting. And at, now there were 400 and they were gathered around North Bridge near Concord. 
The British open fired at the Minuteman and the, the Minuteman fired back. And after five minutes, the British decided to turn back to Boston. Um, their numbers were a little bit more even this time. And the militia now had all of their supplies, so they had more ammunition. And the British knew that, so they decided to turn back to Boston and run away. And on their way back to Boston, though, because it was, it became a huge nightmare for the British soldiers because Paul Revere had alerted all of the people along the route. Um, and so colonists who watched the British march towards Lexington in the early morning, now they were waiting behind fences and barns and trees. They were ready for them. And shots rang out all around the route. So as these British soldiers are marching back to Boston, uh, colonists are hiding in fences and in trees and they're shooting at the British soldiers as they're headed back to Boston. And by the time they made it back to Boston, the Minutemen had killed 73 soldiers and they wounded about another 200. That was nearly half of the numbers of the soldiers that had set out to Lexington and Concord earlier that day. Americans didn't know it at the time, but the war for independence had officially begun with these two battles, the battles of Lexington and Concord. So preparing for war, those battles that happened, now what? Well, it was May of May 10th of 1775 and the First Continental Congress had promised that they were gonna meet again. So they called themselves this time the Second Continental Congress. And it was held with the same delegates from the colonies. Fighting had happened and so it was time to make some decisions. Um, separation from England was still a really troubling thought, though. A lot of people still really didn't want to leave England. They still wanted to be part of the British Empire. So the delegates wrote another petition to King George III, and it was a request. They said they were still going to be loyal to the king, but they wanted to see changes in their policies. They wanted the taxes to change, and they wanted somebody in Parliament to represent the colonists. At the same time, they were prepared for more fighting though. John Adams of Massachusetts took the lead here. He thought the militias were fine, but it was really time that they started to create a real American army. People that were dedicated solely to being part of a military. So let's talk about some important people here. John Adams, he was the lead in the mind behind the new army. And there were already militiamen outside of Boston, and he believed that those militiamen would be the very best people to be part of the First Continental Army. But who would lead this army? John Adams wasn't a military leader. He was just a very intelligent man. Um, he was a lawyer. So, but, so they needed somebody that had some military experience, and there just happened to be somebody in the room that was perfect for the job. George Washington. He had valuable mil military experience, and he was chosen at the Second Continental Congress. <clears throat> he was described and chosen because he had great talent and excellent character. He was who was going to be leading the Second the uh, Continental Army. He was chosen to lead the Continental Army because, one, he had lots of military experience from the French and Indian War. He was also a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, which is their self-government. He was a big supporter of the Patriot cause. He was a big supporter of separation from England. And he was also known for being very wealthy in the colonists. He was a very well-known person, but he also had a very cool head and he was a very strong will, which means that he wasn't he didn't have a very strong temper, so he always thought things out and he never quit. He was always going to get what he needed because he never quit. And so it was settled. George Washington was going to be the head of the uh, Continental Army. Washington, like I said, was to command the Continental Army. And he was going to take those troops that would be the, the Massachusetts militiamen. So those the militiamen that were outside of Ma Massachusetts, they were going to be part of the new Continental Army. And they were camped all around Boston. Uh, Washington headed to Massachusetts to take take charge of the militia. So he was in Virginia at the time, so he headed towards Massachusetts. That would have been north. 
However, before he got there, those militiamen ended up fighting a very important bo uh, battle near Boston. And that was called the Battle of Bunker Hill. Outside of Boston, there are two really big hills that overlook the city. Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. High ground throughout military history is considered to be very important in battles because if you get on top of the high ground, you can kind of take control. Um, you have the advantage. You can see down at your enemy and you can shoot down at your enemy, whereas your enemy has to shoot up and you're not as accurate. Um, you can fire down at your enemy from high ground. You have better, it's just, you can see better. So you want to be on high ground when you're fighting in a battle like this. The, Brit the British knew this tactic, but the thing is they weren't really worried about the militiamen. They still had a huge army and the militiamen were just farmers in their opinion. They didn't know what to do, so they really did not bother to guard those two hills. They just stayed in Boston. And on the night of June 16th, 1775, the militia suddenly decided that they were going to march up Breed's Hill and, and they climbed it. They were going to take it. They, they were also supposed to go up Bunker Hill, but for some reason they ended up going up onto the wrong hill, which was Breed's Hill. They dug trenches all night. Trenches are like tunnels in the ground, except for they're open. Um, they did this all night for protection. If you kind of look in this picture, you can kind of see that they're kind of in ground here. And so they spent all night building these trenches. And when morning came, the British were really surprised to see that the militia was in control of the hill. They could shoot down at these British soldiers now. <clears throat> so the British General Gage was now worried the militia would be able to fire on his troops and use cannons to fire into the ships at the harbor. But what he didn't know is that the militia actually didn't have any cannons. But, but what he didn't know was good for the militia. So the next day, the British decided to take their enormous army and march up Breed's Hill. The colonists didn't have a lot of ammo, so they couldn't waste very much, so they had to wait for the British to be very close until they could fire. <clears throat> and they fired and killed hundreds of redcoats, and the rest ran down the hill. So the redcoats marched up the hill, the militiamen fired down and killed hundreds of them, and the um, British would march back down the hill. But then the British did this one more time. They would march up the hill, and they got the same result. The militia killed hundreds of men. The British marched back down the hill. However, they did it one more time, and the militia were starting to run out of ammunition. So when the, once the third, the third, on the third march, the colonists had to retreat. They had to leave the hill because... They didn't have any more ammunition, and the British still had a lot of soldiers. Unfortunately, the British did win this battle, but they did lose thousands of soldiers in the process, which was about half of their men that they had there in Boston. And even though this battle took place on Breed's Hill, it is known today as the Battle of Bunker Hill. And it's important because they may have lost the battle, but the colonists gained a new confidence that day. They, they gained the idea that they could defeat the British with the right resources. They could take on this enormous army. Um, this was actually considered um, one of the most important battles of the war. Soon after the battle, the colonists found out that King found out King George's answer to the Second Continental Congress's petition when they sent that petition demanding their rights. There had already, there had been this fighting, so King George had found news had heard news of this fighting as well. King George had absolutely no intention of backing down. He was not going to let the colonists tell him what to do, and now because of what the colonists the fighting that had happened, he was ready for a fight. And that's where we're going to end. So we have a lot of more meaty details that we're going to learn about next week. But for 